Saddam Hussein, thought by many to be one of the most evil men who ever lived, was born on the 28th of April, 1937, in the village of al Auja near Tikret, which is in the northwest of Baghdad. His father was a simple sheep herder. It is thought that Saddam never had a relationship with his father. It has been suggested that his father either died or left the family shortly before Saddam was born. Saddam's father was a member of the al Abu Nasir tribe, who migrated to Iraq from Yemen. Saddam's mother was called Suba Tulfa al Musalat. Her grandfather was a man by the name of Telfa ibn Musalat, and he was in fact a grandson of the Emir Omar Bey III of Tikrit, who was in fact a governor of the region. It is thought that Saddam had an older brother, or rather should have had an older brother, but that his older brother died shortly before he was born. Many people suggest that for some reason his mother blamed his arrival on the death of what would have been his older brother, and that she resented him because of his existence in life. After the disappearance of Saddam's father, his mother remarried to a man called Ibrahim al Hassan Muhammad and together they had many children. Saddam's stepfather resented his presence in the house, and this was not helped by his mother, who never warmed towards him. As a result of this, Saddam's stepfather would beat him regularly, which resulted in Saddam going to live with his uncle in Baghdad. This in some ways was a blessing to Saddam, because due to the fact that he was living in the capital of Iraq, the schooling there was much more advanced. And therefore Saddam attended the al Kar secondary school in Baghdad. Saddam was apparently a hard-working student and a man blessed with a certain level of intelligence, enough that he could then go on to study law at a university. As Saddam grew up, the country of Iraq and, in fact, the entire region was undergoing extensive change. The entire region had historically been run by powerful empires. These empires were predominantly the Ottoman Empire and the Persian Empire. The Ottoman Empire controlled massive parts of the region, areas which would now be known as Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Israel. Many historians suggest that the grip that the Ottoman Empire had over these regions was already starting to wane. However, this was accelerated as in the First World War, the Ottoman Empire was on the side of Germany and as such, after the war, the Allied forces completely stripped the Ottoman Empire of all of its regions. The victorious countries, predominantly France and Britain, 
decided to divvy up the region and split it up into distinct countries. However, the formation of these new countries was not done particularly wisely. Rather than splitting regions up and forming new countries based on cultural similarities, instead a more simplistic approach was produced in which lines were drawn in the sand to state that a country ended in one place and another began. In 1932, Iraq was given nominal independence. In reality, Britain still controlled the country. However, the country was given its own head of state. This was King Faisal I. Although Iraq was given nominal independence, Britain still kept control over the country to a large extent. This was because Iraq was an oil-rich country. Britain was able to continue its control over the oil fields of Iraq through the Iraqi Petroleum Company, which was largely owned by the British. When Saddam was around three years old, the Second World War broke out. Although King Faisal I supported the British Empire, there were many within the country of Iraq who were in league with the Nazis. They saw their coalition with the Nazi party as a way of possibly removing British control from Iraq as they did not respect King Faisal I as a true leader. They saw him as simply a puppet of the British. Saddam Hussein rose to power in Iraq as the leader of the Ba'ath Party. However, the Ba'ath Party did not start in Iraq. Instead, it was formed in 1947 in Syria. The basis of the Ba'ath Party was that it was anti-imperialistic, which meant that it rejected Western powers running the region. This call to remove Westerners as the controllers of the region was something that was very popular amongst the population of the region. And as such, the Ba'ath Party spread from Syria to other countries, one of which was the country of Iraq. The Iraqi branch of the Ba'ath Party was set up in 1951. Many believe that the Ba'ath Party was religious in its core, but in fact it was not. The Ba'ath Party was predominantly occupied with the idea of removing Western powers from the countries of the regions, and then those countries coming together to form a coalition which would bring the Arab world back to a position of prominence on the world stage. Because of this belief of removing the Western powers from the region, any government or royal family that was seen to have been in coalition with the Western powers, or was in fact placed in power by the Western imperialists was seen as the enemy and therefore had to be removed. This meant by default that King Faisal I of Iraq was deemed to be an illegitimate leader and therefore had to be removed from power. 
Saddam Hussein joined the Ba'ath Party in 1957 at the age of 20. He was inducted because his uncle was already a member. The Ba'ath Party at this time was a very small entity with perhaps only 200 members. However, this was a time of great social change in the region, and in 1952, officers within the Egyptian army had overthrown their king, King Farouk. The army officers then tried to end British involvement in Egypt. However, in 1958, Iraq was to have its own revolution. On the 14th of July, a coup was launched, which overthrew King Faisal II. King Faisal II and many members of his family were executed. Due to the Ba'ath Party's extensive connections within the armed forces of Iraq, the Ba'ath Party was able to form a government in what became the new Republic of Iraq. This meant that Saddam Hussein was effectively connected to the high politics of the new rulers of the country. However, he was still a very young, so only had a very minor role. The government of Iraq was very unstable, as there were many different parties and entities who had vastly different ideas on how Iraq should be run. For the Ba'ath Party, one of the biggest problems was that the commander of the army, who had actually led the coup against the royal family, a man called Hasim, was completely and utterly against the idea of Iraq joining the United Arab Republic. This obviously flew into the face of the very ideals of the Ba'ath Party, which was that independent states within the Arab world would join together to make the world of their area a power in the world once more. The Ba'ath Party was incredibly keen to join this new coalition because Egypt and Syria had already formed a bond together. The Ba'ath Party also recognized that if these three countries joined together, there would be significant power to overthrow all imperialism within the region. As a result of this, the Ba'ath Party decided to assassinate Hasim. So, on the 7th of October, 1959, Saddam Hussein was chosen, along with a few other members of the Ba'ath Party, to eradicate him so that they could turn Iraq around and push it towards the pan-Arabism that would result in a coalition with the other Arab states. The assassination took place while Hasim was traveling in his car. He was hit with two bullets, one in the arm and another in the shoulder. However, he survived. Saddam himself was also shot in the leg during the attack. However, he managed to escape. Saddam and the rest of the assassins were smuggled out of Iraq and placed in Syria, where they connected with the Syrian branch of the Ba'ath Party. However, others more loosely connected to the plot were not so lucky, as they were arrested, interrogated, 
and put on trial. Saddam eventually left Syria and headed to Egypt, where he took up his studies in law. However, he would not complete his degree because of the events that unfolded around that time. In March 1963, a coup d'etat took place in Syria, but left the Ba'ath Party in control of the country. Within a few years, a man by the name of Al-Assad rose to power to become the leader of the country. He remained in power until he died, and then passed his powers on to his son, who is even now still the ruler of Syria. Three weeks before the revolution in Syria, there was a revolution in Iraq known as the Ramadan Revolution. And during this revolution, elements within the Ba'ath Party and parts of the Iraq army, which were sympathetic to the wishes of the Ba'ath Party, overthrew Hassim's government and took control of the country. Seeing that his party had become the rulers of Iraq, Saddam moved back to Iraq to take up position. However, this would be problematic because their grip on the country only lasted for nine months as a counter coup was launched by a friend of Hassim's and he was successful in taking back the country from the control of the Ba'ath Party. However, with the overthrow of the Ba'ath Party, Saddam decided to stay and work in the shadows. However, in 1964, he was arrested for his connections to the Ba'athist Party. Saddam was given a three-year sentence for having connections to an illegal political party that being the Ba'ath Party, of which he was obviously already a member. However, Saddam did not serve all of his sentence. He escaped after two years and rejoined with the Ba'ath Party. It was after this that he began to rise within the party to various positions of prominence. He was promoted to being a regional commander of the party. He was given this position because he had proved his commitment to the cause in serving prison sentences and for attempted assassinations of other political rivals. Shortly after arriving back from Egypt, he married his first cousin, Sarija Talfa. This was an arranged marriage set up by his uncle who was the girl's father. Together they had two boys, one named Uday who was born in 1964 and another named Kusei who was born in 1966. The two boys were then joined by three daughters, who were born in 1968, 1969, and 1972. In 1968, on the 17th of July, another revolution took place, which saw the Ba'athists once more seize control of the country. One of the reasons that the Ba'athists thought it was particularly important to take control of the country was because the Republican government at the time was seeking ever closer ties to the United States. This obviously went against the ethos of the Ba'athist party, who did not want interference from Western governments. A new Ba'athist government was formed 
and was led by Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr. Ahmed was Saddam's cousin, and feeling that he needed people he could trust, he appointed Saddam Hussein as vice president of the Republic of Iraq. With control of the oil fields of the country, Saddam began changing Iraq, changing its economy, and making it a much more wealthy country. It became one of the richest countries in the Middle East. In order to transform the country with the oil money that Iraq was creating, Saddam had to take away Western influence. At the time, so much of the oil production was actually being controlled by Western countries. So Saddam aggressively nationalized all of the oil in the country so that they could retain all of the profits. In 1973, there was an oil crisis which was caused by the fact that the Arab nations began to restrict the flow of oil to Western countries like the United States and Britain. It is thought that they did this because of the West's support of Israel in its wars with the Arab nations. Oil prices increased by around 300%. Moving from $3 a barrel to just over $12 a barrel. This increase in the price of oil transformed Iraq from a country that was making quite a lot of money from oil to a country that was really flourishing in the high price of energy. With this increase in money, Iraq had the money to invest in itself, and so Saddam began modernizing the country, introducing economic and social changes. Saddam used the money to increase schooling across the country, increasing literacy levels for all across Iraq. He also instigated a form of universal health care, something that Iraq had never seen before. The money was also used to develop other industries and other infrastructures. The idea being that once the oil money had run out, Iraq would have other parts of its economy which would be capable of rising up and filling the gap. As part of this, he revolutionized agriculture, bringing in mechanization to replace the old-fashioned methods that had been used in the past, improved irrigation, and improved crop yield. After nationalizing the oil companies of Iraq, and in doing so, kicking out all of the Western companies that had had control in the past, Iraq was in a vulnerable position in terms of defense. So Saddam Hussein set about forming closer ties with the Soviet Union and in 1972 signed a 15-year pact with them to encourage economic development between them and in doing so, make the state of Iraq more secure. In response to this, President Nixon began sending aid to the Kurds in northern Iraq, who had for a long time wanted their own country. The Kurds used this aid to arm themselves with weapons and then used the weapons to fight for independence, which led to the second Iraqi-Kurdish war. To combat this increase in aid that was being sent to the Kurds, Saddam Hussein signed an agreement with Iran, giving them concessions on various pieces of land 
and in return they agreed to stop sending the Kurdish people aid. This counteracted the extra aid that had been sent by the United States and meant that Iraq's armies were easily able to overcome them within the war. Because of the success of the changes that Saddam Hussein had implemented within the country, he was given the position in 1976 of being the general of the Iraqi armies. The absolute ruler of the country at the time, al Bakr, suspected that Saddam Hussein was moving to secure absolute power for himself. So therefore, al Bakr did a deal with the Syrian regime, which meant that al Bakr would remain as the president of the country. However, in return for Syria's support, after he had gone, Syria would take control of Iraq. Hearing of this, Saddam realized that he would have to rush to take control of the country because it effectively ruled him out from ever being the president. So therefore, on the 16th of July, 1979, he overtook al Bakr and declared himself as the ruler of Iraq. This was a bloodless coup because Saddam Hussein had control of the armed forces and was also backed by many in the Ba'athist party. al Bakr had no choice but to lay down power. Eager to ensure that the same fate would not befall him as president, Saddam Hussein began to take out anybody within the Ba'athist party that was either opposed to his rule or could be a potential rival within the Ba'athist party itself. In total, 68 members of the Ba'athist party were arrested, and many of them were convicted with betraying the Iraqi state by allowing it to come under the control of the Syrian leaders. Many were sent to prison for life, but a total of 21 were executed. This intense purge of the Ba'ath Party in Iraq led to them falling out with the Ba'ath Party in Syria. For decades they had worked side by side and helped each other out with almost everything. But now, with Saddam in control, it had been made clear to them that the Ba'ath Party in Iraq would go its own way. It is interesting to think that as Vice President of the country, Saddam Hussein lifted the living standards of so many Iraqi people with the reforms he put in to infrastructure and to economy. However, when he became president in 1979, this all changed, as he enforced a terrible reign of terror upon Iraq, which led many people to be taken off the street just for being suspected of being any kind of political rival to himself. He decided to put an iron grip on the country and had no worries about enforcing it with the harshest of sentences. He began to terrorize other groups, particularly the Kurds and the Shiite Muslims. It has been estimated that somewhere in the region of 10,000 Iraqi citizens have been tortured as they have been suspected of being in any way politically rivaled to Saddam Hussein's reign. But Saddam Hussein's megalomania did not stop there. 
he began to have statues of himself erected across the country. Murals of himself painted on walls and even had plaques with his name on it stamped onto historical sites. It was as if he was trying to set himself up as an ancient and powerful leader in order to try and legitimize his leadership to those watching around the world. Saddam even put into place fake elections which ran in 1995 and the year 2002, in which he was given nearly 100% of the votes. A figure which in democracy is simply not realistically achievable. With the Iran revolution, which left the Shia Muslims in control of the country, Saddam realized he may have a problem with his neighbor. So in 1980, he initiated a war with Iran. This war lasted for nearly eight years and saw millions of people die on both sides of the border. One thing that surprises many people is that during the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam Hussein was being propped up by the United States. They saw him as the lesser of the two evils and therefore provided him with military aid in order to try and possibly overtake the Iranian government. Considering how relations became with the United States, this is always a thing which surprises many people. What is considered to be particularly worrying about the Iran-Iraqi conflict is that Saddam Hussein used mustard gas and sarin on a regular basis. However, on the other side, the Iranians used child soldiers, and it has been estimated that thousands of teenagers died fighting during the war. Throughout the Iran-Iraq war, most of the time, Iran had the upper hand. However, they could never seem to strike at the heart of Iraq and take control of the country. So the war had gone on for nearly eight years. In 1988, Saddam Hussein forced Iran into coming to the peace table to talk. He did this by threatening them with a new assault of chemical weapons. Knowing that this would be deadly to their population and to their soldiers, and knowing that the Western governments that had been propping up Iraq would not even interfere in this use of chemical weapons, despite the fact that they were publicly condemning them. This meant that Iran simply had to come to peace talks, and as such, the war did come to an end. Both Iran and Iraq claimed victory in the war. However, the war, although slightly dominated by Iran, was essentially a process of continuous stalemate. Partial gains met with partial losses as both sides pushed on either side of the border. Millions of people dead, and in the end, no result whatsoever. Knowing that the war was coming to an end with all of the peace talks, Saddam Hussein decided to use this opportunity to persecute the Kurdish people once more and therefore started a bombing campaign against the Kurdish people within his own country and even hit them with chemical weapons. 
insisting that it was is seen as nothing but a travesty of human waste. It has been estimated that around 80,000 Kurdish people died during this campaign, and maybe as many as another 50,000 were displaced as they seeked out refuge in other countries around the world. Saddam even set up detention camps and put the Kurds through a process called forced Arabization. His intention was, if he was not able to kill them all, because the rest of the world was watching, he would force them to be exactly what he wanted them to be. During the war with Iran, Iraq had borrowed billions of dollars from its nearest neighbor, Kuwait, and found itself in a position where it were not able to pay them back. At the time, Kuwait was a massive oil-producing country, and in order to strengthen its economy, it was producing more oil than many other countries in the world thought that it should. The reason these countries did not want Kuwait producing so much oil was because they were putting so much of it onto the market, which was driving down prices. This meant that a country like Iraq was not making the money that it thought it should, because the price of a barrel of oil was dropping all the time. Saddam Hussein therefore decided to invade Kuwait, which would not only allow him to control the price of the oil that comes out of his country to some extent, it would also mean that he would be able to sell Kuwait's oil, as well as also not pay Kuwait back the billions of dollars that Iraq had borrowed.
and produced a blockade of the Persian Gulf, which stopped Iraq being able to export any of its oil. This obviously crippled the Iraqi economy because oil dominated the entire economy. During negotiations with the West, Saddam Hussein claimed that he would be willing to take his troops out of Kuwait if Palestinian land was taken from Israel and given back to the Palestinians. He knew or must have known that the United States would turn this down. He was probably just stalling for time by offering something knowing full well that the Western Alliance would simply not accept it. Saddam then decided to not allow Westerners to leave Iraq. He even appeared on TV channels with British prisoners claiming that they would simply never leave the country until the situation was resolved. This enraged the Western countries and therefore they decided to form a coalition in order to put in an army force that would free Kuwait from Iraq. Using Saudi Arabia as a launch pad, the Western countries began their coalition against the invasion of Kuwait on the 16th of January. It started with a bombing campaign, and then once the Iraqi army had been weakened, troops flooded into Kuwait and pushed the Iraqis back. In response to this, Saddam Hussein tried to set fire to all of the oil wells in Kuwait, a destructive act of sabotage to punish Kuwait but also to punish the world as the petrochemicals flowed into the atmosphere and caused all kinds of environmental problems across the world. At the time, Kuwait had 730 oil fields. Saddam Hussein managed to set alight around 600 of them. It would take until August that year for all of the oil wells in Kuwait to be extinguished. It has been estimated that in the region around this area, temperatures dropped by around 5% because of the amount of smoke that was in the air blocking the sun's radiation. Over the next decade, the Western powers continued to sucker punch Iraq with more and more sanctions under the justification that they were not trying to punish the Iraqi people, but were in fact trying to reduce Saddam Hussein's ability to produce an army or produce chemical or nuclear weapons. There is no doubt that these sanctions weakened Saddam Hussein and therefore weakened his ability to produce future wars. However, it did drastically reduce the living standards of Iraqi people and led them into a situation where their living standards had dropped to something akin to what they were almost a hundred years ago. This is one of the problems with sanctions. Sanctions are brought in to weaken a regime. However, a byproduct of this is that without a doubt, in all situations, the general population of a country also suffer. Perhaps it is the case that they thought by putting these sanctions on Iraq that it would force the Iraqi people into a revolution and therefore overthrow Saddam Hussein. However, this was very naive because it did not take into account how ruthless 
and how much of an iron grip Saddam Hussein had over the country and the people that lived in it. Despite the harsh conditions of the Iraq economy, due to, in part, the sanctions that were bestowed upon the country, Saddam's grip on power did not wane, as he continued to run the country with an iron fist. He obviously felt safe from the liberation of Kuwait in the fact that the Americans and their Western allies did not press forward into Baghdad and remove him from power. It was a phase of stability for Iraq as he continued to embed himself into every element of society as he tightened his grip on the country as a whole. During this time, however, there was a change in how Saddam ruled the country. The Ba'ath Party had always been pretty much non-religious, as they were pushing for a more secular form of Arabic control. However, after the Kuwait War, Saddam started to emphasize the need for religion in society and began to use that as a form of control over his people as well as his iron grip. His push towards making Iraq more of a Muslim country was also fueled alongside his propaganda that he was the one to defend the Iraqi people from the aggression of the Western countries. By fusing the two together, he almost tried to paint himself as a god-like leader who could protect his people when no one else could. However, in reality, the suffering of the people of Iraq was caused by his leadership and the response of the Western powers in trying to remove him. By now, Saddam's sons from his first marriage Uday and Kusay were all grown up. The youngest of the sons was Kusay. However, intelligence has suggested quite prominently that it was he who was going to take over after Saddam's retirement. The reasons for this are not exactly clear. However, many suggest it is because of Uday's personality and his behavior, which is rather disturbing to say the least. Kusay was the head of the Republican Guard. Kusay was responsible for the crushing of a Shiite Muslim uprising in the marshlands of southern Iraq. In response to the uprising, he flooded the marshlands where they had lived for hundreds of years and in effect made them homeless. It was an ecological disaster, but in the world of Saddam Hussein, little matters except for galvanizing your support and also crushing your enemies. Kusay had displayed all of the heavy-handedness that went along with the way that his father ran his country. And it is maybe for this reason that his father had him down to be the next in line. However, as just mentioned, it was probably Uday's behavior that disqualified him from being the natural successor. By all accounts, Uday was an alcoholic, a rapist, a murderer, and a psychopath. Even to the extent that he would be a liability to a man like Saddam Hussein, who is a mass murderer in his own right. The difference with Uday was that he did not kill for political reasons. He did it just to please himself. He was, in effect, a serial rapist 
and a serial killer. Even in Saddam's eyes, this made him unsuitable to run a country. It has been said that one of his favorite hobbies was to torture members of the Iraqi football team if they lost a match. At one point, his behavior had gotten so out of control that members of Saddam Hussein's family defected to Jordan for safety. It is suggested that he had threatened their lives, and because they knew his character, they believed that he would go through with it. It has also been said that Uday would regularly torture his employees by whipping them across the feet with canes, belts, and whips, sometimes for a reason, and sometimes simply to satisfy his own sadism. He would often be seen prowling the streets of Baghdad in one of his posh sports cars, looking for women that he could pick up off the street and have taken back to his palace where he would engage in involuntary sex with them. Any attempt by a woman to report this would probably see them executed for disgracing a leader of the country. There was, in effect, nowhere for the victims of Uday to turn, because even the police would come to him and tell him if a woman had made an accusation against him. However, in 1996, somebody tried to get rid of Uday Hussein, and they tried to assassinate him. This left him partially disabled. However, it did not curtail his behavior at all. In Saddam's eyes, the United States had ruined the potential of Iraq to become a well-developed country. This is fairly true because the sanctions crippled the country economically. However, it can also be said that this was down to Saddam Hussein himself because of his programs to develop weapons of mass destruction. Had he been cooperative with inspectors throughout this period, it is possible that some of the sanctions may have been dropped. However, his regime was completely uncooperative with the United Nations inspectors, and as a result of this, his country remained blacklisted, and therefore had to continue suffering the sanctions that had been placed upon them that was keeping their country down. UN inspectors had actually come to the conclusion that after the Kuwait war, Saddam had been developing limited chemical weapons, but they also came to the conclusion that Iraq had no effective way of deploying these against foreign nations. However, with the uncooperative stance of his regime, this created a lot of suspicion within the Western powers. And it is this suspicion that led many to talk about the idea of possibly removing him from power. However, despite this, Saddam Hussein's survival would probably have remained intact if not for events that happened on the 11th of September 2001. On the 11th of September 2001, Al-Qaeda launched attacks on the United States and this shook up the world and in the end had terrible consequences for Saddam Hussein. Even though it is most likely he had no involvement in the attacks. 
The attacks on the 11th of September 2001 on the United States involved hijacking commercial airlines and flying them into buildings. The most notable of these was the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. to invade Iraq. However, many other countries across Europe resisted this and refused to get involved. In mid-March 2003, the coalition launched its invasion of Iraq. It was, this time, helped by Kurdish forces, who had been genocided and tortured and beaten and murdered by Saddam Hussein for generations. The invasion only took a few weeks, and by the 9th of April, the coalition forces had completely secured Baghdad. However, by that time, Saddam Hussein and his family had already fled. Six weeks after the invasion, George W. Bush visited Iraq and declared victory for the coalition. However, this was incredibly premature because the invasion had stirred up so much political and religious discontent that many in Iraq were still ready to take up arms against the coalition powers. Although Saddam's family fled Baghdad. His two sons, Uday and Kuzey, were found rather quickly on the 9th of April and died during a military standoff with the coalition forces. It is a shame that they were never brought to trial so that the world could hear of the crimes that they committed and perhaps so that some of the women who had been raped and tortured by Uday could have their day in court. But knowing that they would have little chance of any freedom or even avoiding execution, Uday and Kuze decided to fight it out to the last and therefore died. Saddam, however, had been hiding in the Tikrit region of Iraq. This is where he was originally from, and it is said that during his presidency, he lavished gifts on this area and therefore built a tunnel of trust.
Saddam Hussein was eventually caught on the 13th of December 2003 after an informant gave away his location. He was found in a squalid hole in the ground. Considering the lavish lifestyle he was used to in his palaces, it was a rather interesting end for a dictator like him to suffer. Shortly before Saddam Hussein was captured, the coalition government that was now running Iraq had set up the Iraqi tribunal. This was a series of court cases to try the war criminals of the Ba'ath Party. And so Saddam Hussein was sent to trial. Saddam Hussein was held in a fortified American camp called Camp Cropper. He stayed there for almost a year and a half and eventually started his trial on the 19th of October 2005. Saddam refused to recognize the trials, claiming that they had no legitimacy as they were effectively a kangaroo court set up by illegal invaders. He even went on hunger strike at one point. However, the proceedings continued and his attempts to try and disrupt them had no effect whatsoever. The trial took almost one year to complete, but eventually on the 6th of November, 2006, Saddam Hussein was found guilty of crimes against humanity and was sentenced to die through hanging. Saddam's legal team launched an appeal, but this was quickly turned down. On the 30th of December 2006, the sentence was carried out and Saddam Hussein, the former president of Iraq, was hung to death. Saddam had actually requested to be executed by firing squad, however this was turned down. His body was sent back to Tikrit and was buried there in a family plot. However, with the death of Saddam Hussein, things were still very complicated in Iraq. A caretaker government had been established in Iraq in June 2004. This was followed by Iraq's first legitimate democratic elections in January 2005. The hope of the coalition forces was that by giving Iraq its own true democracy that this would stabilize the country as the people of Iraq would trust in the democratic process. Whereas this is true to some extent, this was not accepted by all in the country and as a result of this, a form of civil war began to be created. In 2011, the United States and its coalition partners began to withdraw from Iraq. It was obviously the case that coalition forces could not remain in the country forever. However, this withdrawal allowed the Islamic State to take over large parts of the country and dominate them with their own religious caliphate. Even today, in the 2020s, there is often political unrest. However, the country does appear to have found some stability. There is less terrorist activity taking place and for once it is possible to see Iraq with a true democratic future. With Saddam gone, Iraq has a new future, a democratic future. However, this can only last as long as those within Iraq 
trust the democratic process. And as long as fundamentalist groups do not try to take over and take power of the country as he and his Ba'ath party once did. Saddam Hussein was one of the most evil dictators this world has ever seen. Is it possible that such a man could take control of Iraq once more? Well, that is to be debated. However, what we do know is that, at least in his case, he was another dictator who eventually faced justice.